Hi everyone, I'm Rick Takis. I'm the Director of Engineering uh, at Teespring on the commerce side of things. So I oversee the buyer and seller facing parts of the platform, kind of everything up until checkout. Um, today I'm going to talk about Teespring, uh, where we started and where we are today. Uh, then talk a bit about our tech stack and how we've made certain decisions as we've scaled and kind of moved from our legacy technology to kind of a more modern Jamstack approach. Um, so diving right in, Teespring at its core is a platform that allows people to create and sell online. Um, it was conceived of to kind of break down some of the barriers to entry around doing this. So things like sourcing the, the blank products, getting them printed, and then actually fulfilling them. To, so we really want to allow people to focus on the design and marketing of their, their products uh, rather than all the kind of logistics around it. Um, so this idea was developed and we were accepted into Y Combinator. Uh, so that was great. And that really jump-started the business. So if we skip forward seven years to today, um, we now have over a million visitors to our site per day. And we've hit more than two and a half years of profitability. So that's that's great kind of in the, the Bay Area to go from Y Combinator to profitable, not always kind of the, the normal story. Um, so the reason we reached this level of success is because we've really found our product market fit. Um, and for that, has, for us, that has been helping people build their own brands and build their own businesses. So an example of how we enable that is if you look at our partnership with YouTube and our partnership with the creators on YouTube. Um, historically, creators would have to you know, generate all their great content, go and try to get as many subscribers as possible, and then turn on ads to monetize their channel. Um, well, we provide another avenue to do that that we think is better because they hang on to more of the, the revenue when they're selling their own merchandise, and it actually furthers fan engagement. They're advertising their own brand and their own products rather than somebody else's product. Um, and it's just been a really great partnership for us uh, with the creators and, and, and Teespring. And it's just really kind of skyrocketed our business and their business at the same time. Um, so let's get into the good stuff and talk about the evolution of our tech stack. So when we started, um, we had a Ruby on Rails monolith in a mono repo. Um, this was great at the beginning because it allowed us with very few engineers to kind of pivot quickly try a lot of different things, kind of build new features very quickly, um, and kind of figure out, you know, find our stride as a company. Um, now, as you can imagine, that doesn't scale super well. So as we've kind of found our product market fit and started to scale, th this code base has just become really bloated. We have multiple frameworks and apps living in there. So we have, you know, Backbone, React, we have ERB templates, we have jQuery kind of sitting on top of all of that, making changes after things are rendered. Um, but on top of that, we also have just a lot of different domains kind of crossing paths here. We have storefronts, checkout, shopping cart, fulfillment, all intertwined in a single repo and a single app, um, which makes it difficult to iterate quickly. And it also brings up kind of unforeseen bugs. We make a change to one part of the code base and it affects something else. We might make a change to storefronts and it affects fulfillment, which just isn't great. So we decided to pull this apart. So if you follow the industry, you know, two and a half, three years ago, everyone was like, Microservice everything, and that you know that sounds great. Um, but you know if you kind of read more recent posts, you see things like, "I miss my monolith." Um, so for us, it's been about trying to find the balance between modernizing our tech stack with microservices, but also kind of getting the good bits of our monolith and not having to rebuild everything from scratch. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Why we've kind of decided not to to tear everything down. Um, so when we were trying to investigate, you know, this microservice approach, we looked at some of the pitfalls we'd seen kind of in the industry. Um, one of the ones that kind of stood out was, was teams taking it very literally to microservice everything and turning every little function into a microservice. Before you know it, you have companies that have thousands and tens of thousands of microservices. They're hard to maintain, they're hard to navigate, there's duplicates and there's, there's no discoverability. So if you want to go and use a microservice, it's hard to discover if, if that already exists within the company. Um, so we decided to take a domain-driven design approach um, and kind of made the decision to shoot for medium-sized microservices, if that's even a thing. Um, so an example on our side would be our shopping cart. So we, we pulled this out of the monolith and really made it kind of agnostic as to where the data comes from and where it goes. And so we now have this fully standalone service 
that we can use on our new storefronts, we can use on our legacy storefronts. Um, it can interact with our, our fulfillment side of things. Um, and it's just much easier to maintain. And it, you know, it, we've been able to, by pulling things of this size out, we've been able to vastly decrease the size of our monolith, which has additional benefits of things like faster CI and CD time. Um, not to mention just easier to maintain and, and easier to reason about. So another challenge we faced in pulling apart the monolith um, was in regards to kind of legacy models and concepts. So there's just these legacy pieces that just don't apply today. And it's maybe easier if I give an example. So we have a concept called a campaign. And this comes from the early days of Teespring when we couldn't print just one item and be profitable. We had to wait until we got a batch of like 10 of that design. Um, so we had this concept of a campaign and everything in Teespring is a campaign where we would check and say, you know, see if we had hit that 10 item mark. And if not, we would restart the campaign. We'd keep those additional, those initial orders and we'd keep restarting until we hit that limit of 10. And then we'd send it off to print and clear out the campaign and then let it run again. Um, this just isn't the reality of, of Teespring today. We can print one item and be profitable. And so it's been really difficult to have to kind of work within this, this concept and model when it doesn't, doesn't reflect Teespring today. So how do we handle reducing, you know, this, this idea? Um, so first we went back to the whiteboard and said, you know, if we had our ideal API today, what would it look like? So kind of just started pulling apart all the different concepts in Teespring and saying like, if we were to make this more modern, what does that look like? Um, and each step of the way, each time we designed part of that data structure, we would ask ourselves, if we were to open this up publicly today, externally, um, would it be sensible? Would people be, able, people be able to build meaningful products on top of that? And would it just make sense? Um, and that was really our gut check to kind of say like, let's make sure we're not surfacing these concepts kind of in our forward thinking um, kind of new API. Um, so once we had that roadmap of like, this is the ideal place we want to get to, you know, how did we go ahead and actually start doing that? So we took this approach um, of kind of an adapter pattern. Um, so we proxy all of the API responses from our Rails code base through API gateway. It then takes uh, that kind of legacy shape and passes it through what we call an adapter, which is just a Lambda function that converts that shape to our more modern ideal shape and then surfaces it out to kind of whatever was requesting that data. So what this really allowed us to do, first of all, is design our ideal API, have it documented, versioned, and modern, um, and reflect the modern state of Teespring. Um, but it also gave us the flexibility to now go back and refactor some of these concepts in our Rails app and start pulling them out without having to worry about every time we make an API change, then going to all of these different apps that consume it and having to update all of them at the same time. So now we only have to update that Lambda, that adapter. So if we make a change on the Rails side to remove something like campaign, we edit the adapter and everything else just keeps working as long as we keep that handshake the same. And because we now have this versioned API, if we were to make a change, we can roll out a V2 and then go and at our leisure, update the apps to start consuming that. Um, so this has really given us a lot of flexibility to kind of pull apart our monolith without having to completely tear it down. So I want to talk about another area that this has really served us well. So in working with our partners, um, each one of them kind of has different requirements for how we send products. So we, we found that we were generating a product feed for each of our sellers and then sending it out to YouTube or Twitch. Um, and when we first started partnering up like this, we um, were building integrations kind of specifically for each partner. And it just seemed like a lot of repeated work. So we ended up coming up with this concept of a generic feed generator. So it generates a product feed for an individual seller. And then similarly, we run it through API Gateway and then through a Lambda that is an adapter for that specific partner. So we have a Twitch adapter and it just reshapes our data for Twitch or for YouTube or for whatever. And again, this has just been really successful for us because if YouTube or Twitch changes their API or we change our API, we just need to edit that adapter to make that update. Um, and, and that works really well. Similarly, when we, after we push product data out, we then have to go and retrieve orders from our partners. And we follow the same pattern. We have a generic order importer. 
when the data comes in, we convert it from Twitch to our generic shape, and then we can process those orders and we can send a response back out through an adapter as well. Um, again, this has just worked really well for us and allowed us to onboard additional partners super fast because we just add an adapter in the places that they need them and we're good to go. Um, so why not start from scratch? Um, I, I think as engineers, it's, it's always kind of a, an instinct to just start from scratch with the latest and greatest technology, kind of tear everything down and redesign it. Um, but I think there's, there's risks in doing this. So one being, you know, we have systems that have been deployed and in production for, for seven plus years. And so they're kind of proven and stable. And over the years, we've found lots of bugs, lots of edge cases um, and fixed those. And so I think to, to imagine that we could go out and just start from scratch and address all those on our first try is unlikely. So there's risks in introducing new bugs or solved edge cases um, and kind of like repeating those mistakes. Um, the second part is it comes at the cost of new feature development. So we want to keep moving forward and, and pushing out new features for our, our sellers and, and buyers. Um, and if we step back and said, we're going to rebuild our monolith, um, we would be sacrificing many of those new features because we, we, you know, we're still a small team, a relatively small team. And, um, you know, it would take us a year plus to rebuild everything and we would just not be able to roll out our new features that we want to. And so I think that was a trade-off that we just weren't willing to make. Um, but by wrapping our, our old code, code base in this kind of fence of the API gateway and adapters, it allows us to build modern apps on top of our legacy platform. So here's in a nutshell what our, our architecture looks like today. So as we talk, talked about, um, we got our Rails monolith, which handles most, most of our data. That goes through API gateway and either hits a, a Lambda and then kind of out to our, our front end apps or our partners. In this same kind of bucket is where our microservices live. So we've got our shopping cart, checkout, things like that. Um, and um, the nice part at this point is that some of our microservices don't even have to touch the, the Rails app in any big way. So we can have our front end apps that are out living in Netlify and going through the, the API and then hitting um, a microservice and that kind of returns back up to the front end app without ever having to hit our Rails code base. So that's that's been just a, a huge time saver for us in building new applications. Like it's just it's just much faster with this well-defined API um, and that we can deploy the pieces of. So I wanted to just take a moment to also touch on a couple other things we've done around um, our engineering velocity, um, specifically on the front end. Um, we put in a big effort to normalize our React apps. Um, so what I mean by that is we got them all up to the same version. Um, we created a shareable ESLint configuration that's in our NPM package. So it actually pushes out uh, to any React app when we, when we spin that up. And so they all have the same linting. We created a create React app template. So the folder structure and everything is the same across all of our apps. Um, and this is kind of in response to, we had many React apps and some of them were using TypeScript, some of them were using Immutable, some of them were kind of in all different shapes, Redux or not Redux. Um, and so we kind of just put down on paper our, our best practices and then made a starting point for that and got all the apps up to that. And the reason we did this is because there was a big lag time when context switching from one app to the next for our engineers. So now when you jump from React app to React app, it's very familiar. You know kind of where everything is. So that's been a really big productivity boost for us. Um, the last piece I'll mention is we've pretty successfully implemented a component library that's shared across these apps. So in designing this, we kind of had a couple of goals. One is to define the kind of most basic component that we wanted to share between the apps. So let's say a dropdown, and that'll have minimal styling. The only amount of styling there is to lay it out and make it functional, but then that can be imported and styled to match the app. But then we also have a a CSS file that sits on top of this that is the Teespring theme or Teespring styles. So then you can import that and you can actually get the full Teespring branding. So we did it in this way to add the most flexibility that um, we can. But also now, you know, as we're updating our brand, we can adjust this one style sheet and anywhere that was consuming our Teespring styles and now it gets updated. So that's been just a huge boost for us as well. Um, so lastly, I want to talk about a project that we're really excited about that's going to be rolling out in the next few weeks, um, and that's our branded storefronts. So in keeping with helping people build their own brands and build their own businesses, 
This is a feature that we just really thought was necessary. So our branded storefronts are gonna allow our sellers to have a fully customizable experience. They can adjust their logo, fonts, colors, text, all of these things, and it'll really look like their own site when people land on it. Um, they'll also be able to customize their domain, so bring their own domain or, or you know, purchase one through Teespring. Um, and um, this is kind of like the next level of customizability, and rather than living in our marketplace, they now have their own website. Um, so we're in a late stage beta with this and it's going really well. And so I wanted to just touch on a couple of the ways we've implemented this and the benefits we've seen from it. So this is fully utilizing our new API, our commerce API. Um, and these sites are dynamically deployed to Netlify and they're living kind of on the edge network there. So, um, we've seen huge performance increases and in kind of doing it in this way. And as a result of the performance increases, we're seeing an uptick in conversion rate, uh, specifically on mobile, because people can load the site much faster than our kind of legacy sites. Um, and so kind of looking to the future of what we want to do next, we're still working to pull, pull apart and migrate away from our monolith, but we want to continue that pattern of doing it kind of safely and in bite-sized pieces. And the way that we're, we're prioritizing that is whenever we're about to do some new work, we kind of look and if we're going to have to touch the legacy code base, we kind of front load modernizing that piece of it or pulling it out or making a microservice out of it. And then we do our new work um, and just kind of bite by bite, that's pulling apart our, our monolith. Um, and the last part I'll, I'll mention around the branded stores is currently they're living in React and we're moving more and more towards uh, making those kind of a statically generated sites. So we're looking into Next or um, Gatsby and kind of comparing our options there. And we've started to do some experimentation around that as well. Um, but that's how we've we've we are in the process and how we have moved um, our large legacy app and concepts to a more modern Jamstack approach. Um, yeah, so I'll be I'll be taking questions after this session, um, but feel free to reach out and I'll do my best to follow up if you have any questions. Thank you very much.